Letter 3. Since these letters take you into a spiritual mental dimension transcending the human plane of activities and concerns, they will be best absorbed if preceded by a time of stillness and relaxation. Quiet your minds. If possible, going into a state of inner silence of thought. It is only when you are in this completely receptive state that these letters will penetrate your human thought with their reality. My boundless celestial love impels me to return again and again to write to mankind with the intention that finally, as many of you who are ready to receive it, will possess the knowledge which will enable you to transcend your humanhood and merge into Father Consciousness, the true love consciousness, in which are realized all things bountiful and beautiful. As I have said previously and want to repeat, my entire mission on earth was prompted by love and was directed only at teaching the truth of existence, for without this knowledge there is no hope of redemption from the travail which mankind is born to endure. I know this statement will bring much grief to sincere and dedicated followers of the Christian religion and those who have centered their entire faith on the person of Jesus. But I tell you truly, to succeed in ridding yourself of the humanhood which holds you back from the full realization of universal truth and the understanding of the true nature of the spiritual human condition I termed the kingdom of God, you must turn away from the old dogmas of salvation by the blood of the Lamb, the Trinity, and other beliefs and come with perfectly open receptive minds to the truth of existence. No other salvation is possible. God cannot save you, since in ignorance of the facts of existence, mankind will continue to make the same earthbound mistakes till the end of time, thus creating his own sickness and misery. Furthermore, no matter what a man's belief may be in regard to salvation from sins, this is a human fallacy, since the law of cause and effect is imponderable and an intrinsic, inherent, natural characteristic of existence. You cannot divorce effects from causation, nor can you erase causation and still have effects. In every level of being, this is truth. You may now be sufficiently advanced in your thinking to be able to receive the following fundamental truth concerning your earthly existence. The law of cause and effect, reaping and sowing, is the visible effect of what you call electromagnetism, and no one who has any knowledge of science would expect God to set aside the laws of electromagnetism, which are those of activity, bonding, rejection. Activity, bonding, rejection, or movement, attraction, repulsion, are the fundamental impulses of existence and of human consciousness itself which have brought about your visible forms in life, and are the only instruments or tools of creation. They are responsible for the formation of substance or matter, and also for the development of individualized forms and finally of personality itself in all living entities. Since these laws are fundamental to your individualized existence, it is impossible to set them aside. Therefore, you cannot ignore the problems inherent in your individualized existence and believe that God will save you from them. Your only hope of final escape of stepping off the treadmill of human experience is to recognize and acknowledge them and then work minute by minute to transcend them and eventually merge in purity of mind, heart, and action and become one with universal love consciousness, the Father which does the love work. At the same time, as you grow in awareness of the true nature of the Father within you and transcending you and all around you, you will come to have undeviating faith that in every circumstance you can draw upon the inspiration, power, and upliftment directly from the Father within and around you. You will come to know it is really the Father which supports and guides you into the kingdom of Father Love Consciousness. It will become abundantly clear to you that while the Father is universal, it is also individual for you. It knows you, is aware of your thinking and your problems. Within the Father Love Consciousness are the perfect solutions awaiting your recognition. When you recognize them, you will be released from pain when you become pliable and willing to listen. 
Until you are willing to listen, you will never be filled with the Father Love Consciousness. I will tell you a parable. Imagine a child screaming and kicking because he wants ice cream. All the time he is making this noise, his father is waiting patiently at the door of his room to show him that he has brought him ice cream and fruit. You may think this parable is improbable. Nonetheless, it is true. Mothers will remember times when children have been inconsolable over something, refusing to listen to what mother is trying so hard to tell them. And yet, mother has the solution waiting for them the moment they stop making a noise and dry their tears. I can see the travail of people and their crying and weeping, and my compassion is boundless. You are heard, but within the context of your present consciousness, there is little I can do for you. I cannot penetrate the thongs and chains of your years of ignorant thinking and acting. I see the pain perpetuated in the churches, in services and pulpits by ignorant sermons. I see nations and their people trying so hard to grapple with the difficulties arising from their traditional values, cultures, and religious beliefs. I see the limitations in their daily living, the lack of fulfillment of their needs and purposes, and the suffering emanating from relationships of every kind. The collective consciousness emanating from the world is a miasma of fears, resentment, angers, emotional turbulence of passionate desires, revenge and exhaustion, interthreaded with compassion, determination to uplift world consciousness, dedication to the search for unconditional love by those who have received inspiration, and a degree of enlightenment. I come close to people who call on me and work with them to relieve their stress. But their mindset and beliefs are so strongly imprinted in their brains that my truth cannot reach through and bring new knowledge to their minds. Many people have heard, albeit briefly and imperfectly, but have lacked the courage to accept new ideas and speak out. Furthermore, the time has not been right to reach through barriers of human consciousness to teach you. But now, the time is right. You have moved into a new dispensation of vibrational frequencies which will enable you to more easily rise from the materiality of the previous age. This may sound a strange statement, but there is a universal store of knowledge regarding energies you do not begin to understand. At this time, there is no earthly mind capable of understanding. It is only possible for you to imagine the spectrum of energy, which is not truth. It will help you, therefore, if you can accept my statements, taking them on trust, because they are true. You are moving into new frequencies of vibration pertaining to human consciousness, which will enable you to move forward into this spiritual, mental development I described in Letter 1. Since I have diverged, I must now repeat, you can no more escape the most fundamental laws of existence regarding your thinking and feeling, sowing and reaping, then you can escape the laws of electromagnetism in your material world. For electromagnetism is the impulse producing the law of sowing and reaping, just as electromagnetism produces form within the fundamental field of energy particles. Therefore, it is not possible to continue to believe in Christian dogma and also try to follow these letters because dogma relating to salvation by my death on the cross, the Trinity, physical resurrection from the dead, and use of incense and set forms of prayer are fallacious, and the facts now presented to you in these letters are truth. The dogma and the sacramental trimmings are what you would term red herrings, to gain your attention and allegiance, but obscuring the truth of my teachings. Therefore, these letters had to be written. The only way I could reach the world at this present time when it is poised to enter a new mind-emotional dispensation was by using a receptive, obedient, and deprogrammed mind to receive the instruction and do the manual work for me. These letters offer the only true means by which people will find the path to the spiritual dimension in which all human error fades away and only love remains. Anything else which may be said is purely human rationalization and reason, and these are not truth. People are seeking new ways to resolve old problems, particularly in America. 
But until they understand the true nature of life, the ego, and the laws of existence, they will but strengthen the pull of the ego, and their pain will continue. Remember, as I record for you in the following pages the simple truth I spoke two millennia ago, this truth remains constant and consistent. Therefore, it is only possible to deepen your understanding of truth, not to alter it. Have you realized as you have read the first two letters that all I spoke to the people of Palestine was a direct outcome of my having perceived the reality of existence in the desert, that nothing was solid? Have you remembered that in my transcendent state, as I looked at the rocks, sand, mountain, waters below me in the Dead Sea, all appeared to be a shimmer of moats? Rock, sand, mountains, water were differentiated one from the other, only by the difference in the intensity of the shimmer of motes, and by the apparent density of motes within the shimmer. There is no other way I can describe what I saw when on earth or convey the facts concerning the true substance of matter, and the apparently solid fabric and construction of your world. In modern speech, you would probably call the shimmer of motes a vibration of particles. Perhaps you could combine the two terms and describe the most fundamental, visible reality as a shimmer of particles. This conveys the sense of the light glow in which I saw the particles dance. Having said all the foregoing as introduction to my account of my activities in Palestine, let me take you to another day 2,000 years ago, when the sun shone and the sky was a clear, clear blue, and I started to climb the hills with my disciples in an effort to retire to rest, meditate, and pray. But this was not to be. We had thought to escape, but despite telling the people of our intentions, we were first followed by a few who then shouted to others that we were going into the hills. Although we begged them to return to their homes, the few eventually grew into a great concourse of people tagging along behind us. They were insistent that I should speak to them. You may wonder why they were so anxious to listen to me. Intuitively, they knew that I spoke words of life to them. Always, I showed them the activity of the Father around them, and this gave them hope and helped them to see the world with new vision. I spoke to them of love, and they felt comforted. This was why I could say to them, knowing that they would understand and agree with me, Come on to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is light and my burden easy. They knew that when I spoke these words, as I frequently did, I was comparing the rules and laws of the Jewish leaders with the truth I was presenting to the people. So it was that when I was besought by the people to teach them, what could I do but sit down on a rock above them and teach? I was determined that if they had come this far to hear me, they would hear something they would remember and possibly speak about all their lives. I knew that despite all I had told them about the Father and Father love, they were still apprehensive of rejection by God. Although I had tried to help them understand that the Father of which I spoke was not the personalized God which they worshipped, I knew very well that they were confused. Although I had told them again and again that the Father was within them, they were still worried that they might incur punishment from on high by believing my words. What should I teach them that day? I asked the father. Then I noticed the goats and the sheep feeding on the hillside, under the vigilant care of their shepherd, and my message for the day entered my mind. I stood up and shouted so that my voice would carry to the back of the crowds. You see these sheep and goats feeding on the hills? The sheep are in one place and the goats in another. Consider the sheep. They are patient and non-aggressive toward each other, even when huddled tightly in a corner of their pen. They feed quietly, never claiming ground which is not theirs, leaving the pasture closely cropped but not damaged, allowing the grass to recover after they had passed over it. Most importantly, they listen to their shepherd's voice. Therefore, he takes good care of them. He guides them into the best pastures, and he sleeps with them at night that they may not be threatened or attacked by dogs or robbers. Look at the goats. How they scramble and leap over the rocks and get themselves into awkward or dangerous places. 
They tear at the brambles and the foliage of trees. They are despoilers. Were it not for their use to mankind, there would be no place for them other than to be tethered all day or put out into the desert. I look at you below me, and I know that amongst you are many sheep, and also among you are many goats. There were a few angry murmurs, but on the whole, people good-naturedly jostled and ribbed one another, pointing out the goats and laughing and nodding. It was good to see them laughing, and so I continued. You can tell the sheep by their homes, the way they treat their neighbors, and the way they are regarded by all in their community. You can likewise tell the goats, are they likely to have many friends? There was a loud roar from the crowd. No! Followed by much laughter. Does the shepherd follow after the goats and care for them, or must they look after themselves and come home by themselves to be milked at night? Again the crowd laughed and shouted various replies, some of them very amusing and witty. And so it is with you who are sheep and those of you who are goats. You are protected by the Father if you are sheep, and you are not protected by the Father if you are goats, because you are obstinately following your own desires every day and possibly leaving a trail of destruction behind you. Tell me, can the Father protect the people who are goats? The crowd was silent but listening intently. Will you say then that the Father is angry with the goats and will not protect them? Or will you rather say that just as the shepherd cares for his sheep and would care for the goats if they would allow it, the Father loves sheep and goats equally, but is powerless to protect equally because of the goats' natural behavior? Also, consider the feeding habits of sheep and goats. Sheep are content to eat grass only, for which their stomachs are perfectly designed, but the goat will eat anything he comes across, having no respect whatever for his constitution. So it is with people who have no regard for what they feed their minds with, since they have no fixed goal or clear purpose. Like goats, they do not recognize when mental food is harmful or is taking them in the direction they should not go in their daily lives or whether it will lead them into harmful myth or dangerous fallacy. They roam, picking up the mental equivalent of brambles, old shoes, bits of cloth, leaves, thistles, weeds, for they lack good sense. A man called out to me, Master, what if a person who is a sheep makes a mistake and gets himself into trouble? Will the father then abandon him? I asked him a question by way of answering him. What does the shepherd do when one of his sheep falls into a pit or tumbles over a cliff, or gets caught in brambles. I will tell you, the shepherd leaves his flock, and swiftly seeks out the missing sheep, and will not leave it until he has brought it to safety. So it is with the father. Not even a sheep can avoid doing wrong in one way or another. But rest assured that the father immediately responds to its bleeding, and rescues it. And if a goat should begin to behave like a sheep and heed the shepherd's voice, then he too will come under the protection of the shepherd and will be cared for, even as sheep are cared for. So it is with you and the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Several voices called out, asking me to tell them what I meant by the kingdom of God. What I am telling you is unlike anything you have yet heard, from any prophet at any time. Do not try to understand what I am saying by thinking of what you have been told by your teachers. They can only repeat from the scriptures and have no personal knowledge of the kingdom of God or heaven. God is not contained with any one place, but is everywhere, as are the heavens and air above you. The Holy Word spoke truly when it says, In God you live, move, and have your being. For the kingdom of God is above, around, and also within you, and you can enter the kingdom of God. People shouted impatiently, But what is it? It is a state of mind and heart which is fully possessed by God, your Father. When you are in this state, the Father is the head of your body and directs everything you do and all of your life. Some of the people grumbled. How can that be? It is possible to be so emptied of self, of selfish desires, enmities, angers, jealousies, greed, vindictiveness, 
that only God is left in control within your mind and heart. What happens then? asked the woman. Then you enter into the state of being which is God-directed. It is altogether beautiful and glorious. It is love, it is generosity, it is caring for other people as you care for yourself. It is non-judgmental since you accept other people exactly as they are, knowing that they too are God-children and are equally in the Father care. It is happiness beyond measure, beyond description. It is joy in the beauty of the world. It is life unlimited and increased energy. It is health and it is the fulfillment of your every need before you even know that you have such a need. Why do the rabbis not tell us these things? Several voices complained. Because I alone have seen the Father. I alone know how the world has been made and the laws of existence. And because I know all these things, you have but to come to me and ask, and I will reveal all that has been given to me. I tell you truly, as many of you as believes and understands and seeks to put my words into daily practice will be saved from the tribulation that mankind endures. You suffer because you do not understand how you have been created and the true purposes for which you were born. You were born to be sons and heirs of the Father. You were born to enjoy all that the Father is in itself and all that it can give you. But you turn your backs on all the glory of the kingdom and try to find pleasures in earthly things. While you do this, you will never find the kingdom of God, nor enter into the kingdom of heaven. How shall we enter the kingdom of heaven? I have already told you. You enter the kingdom of heaven when you repent of all that you are in your heart and mind. When you take your evil to the Father and ask forgiveness and pray for the strength to be cleansed of your evil thoughts, words, and deeds, and you finally get rid of them, then you may be sure that you are about to find the kingdom of heaven. When you have accomplished this, you will find that your attitudes toward others are changing, for the Father will be doing its love work within you. You will be freed of the chains and thongs of evil desires and deeds which previously bound you and made you a captive in the world. More than this, you will find that the Father does satisfy your every need. A woman shouted, I have a need at this very moment, Master. I am hungry. The people laughed, but then several voices joined in, saying, We have been with you for many hours. You made us walk and walk before you would consent to teach us. We have shown you we are the good sheep. Will you not help us and satisfy our hunger? I realized that they spoke the truth and felt deep compassion for them. They had followed after me, not just for healing, but because they longed to know the truth as it had been given to me by the Father. I had told them that the Father satisfies their needs. This would be an opportunity to show them the power of faith and the power that is God. I would prove to them that nothing is impossible when you truly believe as I believed and perceived. I called my disciples to me and told them to find out if there were any present who had food. They found a young boy with loaves and fishes and brought them to me. I withdrew some way from the crowd and quietly contemplated the loaves and fishes, knowing that they were but God-mind power, the substance of all matter made visible. I know that God-mind power was limitless and powerfully active within my consciousness. I knew that the nature of the Father is the fulfillment of need. As I blessed the food, I felt the power flow fully through my mind, my body, and hands, and I knew the people's hunger would be satisfied. I did not know how this would be. I just knew it would. I then took the baskets of food and told the disciples to distribute it, feeling absolutely certain that everyone would have as much food as they needed. As it was broken and passed around, so did it multiply itself, until all the throng were fed and satisfied. There were several baskets of leftovers. In this way I demonstrated that matter, whatever is visible within the universe, is mind-consciousness made visible through the vibration of the motes, which science terms particles. Changes in the vibration of motes, hence changes 
in matter take place as a result of powerfully directed, disciplined, focused movement, imagery, in the mind, consciousness, energy, when one acts purely out of a love consciousness to accomplish good for others. The only limits to the Father love work within the world are the limits which man's mind sets upon that work. Such changes in matter can only take place when the consciousness of man is perfectly in harmony and united with Father Universal Consciousness. Although there was amazement amongst the people and my disciples when the people were fed in this way, not one of them understood how such a thing was accomplished. They could only conclude this was the greatest miracle they had ever seen. It also confirmed their belief that I was the Son of God. Another day, I was sitting under a tree outside Bethesda, surrounded by people who had brought their sick to be healed. As always, they marveled at the return of life and health to these people, and wondered how such miracles could be done. Again, I tried to make them understand the power of faith. In the Gospels, it has been stated, I said, that if a man had faith the size of a mustard seed, he would be able to move mountains. This statement is a misinterpretation of what I truly said, and it reveals how little my disciples and gospelers understood my teachings when we were on earth. If a person were to have faith the size of a mustard seed, what does that mean? How can you measure faith in such a way? Faith is faith. It is a power of total conviction in the mind, possessing the mind, and cannot be restricted in size. Faith arising out of your need to believe in something, because such a belief will serve your purposes in some way, can be powerful and strong, but never could be estimated in size. Belief is even stronger. Belief is the offspring of hearsay and logic. Because you have heard something and been convinced that what you have heard or read is true, you develop a deep belief in what you have heard. You believe in a total, complete way which defies contradiction. I was constantly telling the people, Believe you will receive, and you will receive. However, I knew at the time that it would be well-nigh impossible for the people to ever have the faith which would cause miracles to happen, since no matter how much I might explain truth to them, they would still never have the intense knowing given me in the desert. But now as I relate in small measure the story of my sojourn on earth in Palestine, it is with the intention that you, my reader, will begin to perceive and understand the knowledge I was given during my enlightenment. My intention is to give you knowledge. Hearsay is when you are told something, but you cannot really prove it is true. Knowledge is when you are told something or read something, and because what you have now heard or read complies logically and realistically with all related items of knowledge already in your mind, and you can understand and believe it in a realistic, logical way, the new information becomes knowledge. You know that what you now know is true. You have a sense of conviction. Up to this time, some of you have had faith in Jesus Christ, but you have been like precocious children. Your faith has been partially blind and accepting, yet interwoven with much doubt. Therefore, whatever you needed to be done for you, you depended on Jesus for the work to be accomplished. Whereas, in fact, Much of what you believe you have derived directly from Jesus has been your own faith in Jesus made visible in the form of things asked for. While this childlike faith is very important to your well-being, those of you who are capable of moving onward on the spiritual path to perfection must now reach a deeper level of true knowledge of the relation between mind and matter. Without this foundation, people will continue to flounder in religious myths and will be locked into the misery of the human condition. When I was on earth, I spoke truth to the people, but it was continually misinterpreted. What I really said regarding faith was this. You see this great big tree? It has grown out of the tiniest seed imaginable. See the vast trunk and branches and foliage? All that enormous growth has come out of a small seed. 
How did such a thing come about? From whence came all the wood in the tree and the foliage which adorns it? Is not this as much a miracle as are the miracles I perform for you day after day? Is not the growth of this tree as much the work of the Father as the healing which takes place in sick people? I ask you, what is a seed? Can you tell me? No, you cannot. But I will tell you. It is a tiny entity of consciousness knowledge. It is the consciousness knowledge of what it will become. It is a fragment of consciousness drawn from the divine creative consciousness. It is a fragment of mind power drawn from the father mind power, which, when planted in the earth and watered by rain, will begin to clothe itself with the visible matter of which it possesses knowledge deep within itself. This knowledge is true. It is firm. It is strong and undeviating. This self-knowledge embodied in the seed is a conviction in consciousness. All life forms arise out of this one-pointed self-knowledge, a conviction in consciousness. This conviction in consciousness is what separates the inanimate soil and rocks from all that lives and grows upon the face of the earth. Where there is no conviction of consciousness or knowledge of identity, there is no growth. The consciousness within the soil and rocks remains consciousness in a dormant form. Therefore, if you could believe in what you ask for, as powerfully as does a mustard seed know its own identity, you would be able to do anything you wanted to do. If you could carry within your mind a seed, the perfected plan of your most heartfelt goals, and know beyond all doubt that it can grow and come into perfect fruition, you would see this wonderful seed take on a life of its own which would presently manifest in your life. And you could surely move the mountains in your lives, those mountains which stand across your path and prevent you from achieving all that you would like, mountains which, in times of recklessness and evil thinking, have been created by yourselves. If you only understood creation and existence, you would be able to live lives of total freedom, limitless achievement, and transcendent joy. Seek to understand, and you will find that little by little, understanding will come to you. Knock on the door of the universe, giving access to God, the universal Father Consciousness, and eventually you will find the door swinging open, and you will have entrance to the secrets of the world. Only believe, and you will receive. I also reminded them at times, only those with pure minds and hearts will accomplish these mighty things. The wicked may flourish for a while, as have kings and marauding armies and others hoarding iniquity in their minds. They have been permitted to do their work for a while, since certain good will also arise out of the evil. But eventually they fail, and their names are reviled by the rest of the world. Therefore, as many of you as would succeed, examine your motivations. Desires born solely of selfish longing for wealth or comfort eventually end in disappointment, sickness, and death. And I say to you who read these words, let no one dare to deny the truth I speak until they too have walked the path of self-renunciation which I walked on earth and reached the same union with the Father and the heights of incontrovertible knowledge and understanding as I possessed. When you have achieved all this, you will no longer have any desire to deny the truth I speak to you, but will be unable to restrain yourselves from joining me in teaching your fellow men. Until that time, hold your peace and let no man know your ignorance. How often throughout the world people gladly embrace my teachings as being highly moralistic and the most perfectly formulated guidelines to good behavior and daily living. However, they add quickly that the stories of miracles should be discounted since such apparitions of natural laws of the universe are not possible. This type of thought is building barriers to the future progress in spiritual scientific development of which the human mind is capable. In fact, I did not come to earth to introduce a new religion or higher moral code than that given by Moses in the Ten Commandments. My purpose was to bring a new perception of God as Creator and understanding of existence itself. 
out of that knowledge would come a new way of life. The correct attitude towards my mission on earth in this third millennium is to acknowledge that the miracles I performed are beyond the capabilities of the average human being at this time. However, such miracles were examples of what could be achieved in the future when people's minds were fully imbued with the true knowledge of existence and also, through faith, meditation, and prayer, fully attuned to and imbued with universal life, love consciousness. Was it really true I walked on water when my disciples boarded a boat to cross the lake? If you have read the biblical account of this incident, you will realize that the disciples had left me behind. I yearned for an opportunity to withdraw from all human contact, retire to the hills, and once more enter into a profound meditation to allow my consciousness to merge into the universal dimension of God consciousness. While in this spiritual state transcending human consciousness, all awareness of physicality disappeared, and ecstatically I was lifted into the universal stream of life and knew that the universal life was all. Life was the reality of my beingness, and all else were but temporary changing appearances of universal life made visible I knew. I felt I was life itself, and as I slipped beyond earthly consciousness into the universal life consciousness, the laws governing my physical body were transcended and no longer applied to the flesh and blood of my human body. I longed to move about in this new transcendent state and found myself floating out of my cave. I could see my disciples on the lake and knew they were in distress. Effortlessly, I floated down over the hills toward the shore, and as I began to regain contact with my normal human concerns, in this case my disciples, I found myself coming to rest on the waters. However, I was still in that condition where I realized fully that I myself was life individualized, and therefore my body was suffused with life power, which continued to lighten and transform the atomic structure of my physical state. You must understand that hearing and thinking in the human consciousness state and the ascension into the transcendent realization of universal life, when the personal consciousness is now withdrawn from the bodily condition and wholly merged in universal father consciousness, belong to two entirely different dimensions of being. The human consciousness can receive inspiration from the universal Father consciousness, but the inspiration received mingles with the human condition and is frequently misinterpreted according to the store of knowledge already controlling the brain and therefore the mental processes themselves. Unfortunately, the inspiration you receive is contaminated and distorted by your present, strongly maintained belief, whereas the transcendent perceptual and realization state rises out of, emerges from, the physical condition. The brain is no longer in control. It no longer has any influence on the transcendent perceptual state, which is truth itself. It is no longer controlled or affected by human belief. It is in a state of what really is, back of visible manifestation and existence, instead of in the human dimension of what it believes existence to be. It is in the transcendent state of consciousness that miracles are but normal working of universal law. Before I continue with this account of my life on earth, I want to stress again that everything in the universe is a particular and individualized state of consciousness made visible. I have had to descend from my present state of consciousness of universal love in order to experience again my life on earth which remains indelibly imprinted within the consciousness energy of the world itself, dating back to the time of its moment of creation. You must understand that when I left my body in Palestine, I left everything pertaining to that life behind me. I had fulfilled my mission. Therefore, when I died on the cross, I was set free. I was lifted into glorious light to partake of that light, to be the light, and rejoice in the light, which is universal love, life, beauty, harmony, joy, and rapture. Moving between different levels of consciousness is no easy or pleasant assignment. 
It is only because my mission on earth was not completed when I died in Palestine that I now return to help you prepare to enter a new age, a new phase of individualized existence on earth. You may gain some understanding of what I mean by the discomfort of this enterprise when you remember the times you have recalled some deep sadness in your life and you find yourself reacting with almost the same degree of tension and emotional stress as you did when the sadness actually took place. Reflecting on past suffering and sorrow will make you want to cry. You will feel a return of the original depression and anguish as you relive that time in your imagination. You may want to withdraw from people because your consciousness has now descended from your former state of happy, peaceful equilibrium to experience, yet again, the lowered consciousness vibrations and consciousness forms you created at the initial time of your suffering. Changing moods indicates a change in your consciousness energies. A lift in your consciousness vibration gives you a physical, emotional, and mental lift, making you feel happy. A drop in your consciousness energies will depress the functioning of your entire system, and you will feel the onset of depression, or, at the very least, a drop from the form of buoyancy you are enjoying. I am describing for you a fact of existence. Your entire universe manifests the differing frequencies of vibration of consciousness energy particles. As these frequencies move up or down from one level to another, so do the visible and physical structures manifest differing levels of energy, and there is a change of mental patterns and emotions and appearance. To descend from my state of consciousness to re-enter the conditions of my time on earth is prompted only by my love for mankind. For 2,000 years, Christians have been reliving the trauma of my crucifixion. Some people have experienced the stigma, which is nothing more than a hysterical and morbidly emotional response to what they believe I endured. People have worked themselves up into an emotional pitch akin to frenzy while imagining the anguish of my suffering before my death. Their emotional gratitude for what I endured sends them into a state of physical distress. This is being written on your Good Friday, and I have come specially to talk to you about my crucifixion and to tell you that you must abandon all the drama associated with the remembrance of this day. I died, and that was, for me, a wondrous release. It is time that people wake up from their long, long dream and come to understand existence as it really is, and the truth concerning my crucifixion, which has been hidden till this time. On Good Fridays, year after year down the centuries, you have created a contaminated traumatic consciousness state of being throughout the world, as far removed from the spiritual dimension of universal creative consciousness as hell is removed from heaven. Now that I have chosen to relive my life on earth in the persona of Jesus through the mind of the one who is receiving my words in order to help the world move on to a new phase of spiritual mental development, I ask those who can receive my words to give up this practice of remembering my death and exercising physical self-denial during your Lenten fast to commemorate my 40 days in the desert. As you must realize from this narrative, my time in the desert was one of great joy and blessedness of spirit. Many events of great spiritual significance took place just prior to my death, which are excellent examples of the great cosmic laws in action within your dimension of existence. I am now giving you a brief account of those important events since it is my purpose to enlighten your minds wholly, to give you knowledge beyond any knowledge yet received by any other person in your universe. When I began to prepare my disciples for my approaching death, it was an immensely difficult task. They could scarcely contain their shock and astonishment. The thought of my being crucified as an ordinary felon was repellent beyond words, and neither did they want to lose me from their midst. I had called them to follow me and leave behind lives which had been fairly prosperous. They had left their families and homes to rebuild their lives around me and my work. They had taken pride in my progress through the towns. They had been willing to be associated with me and be known as my disciples, 
despite the rejection and harsh criticism of their religious leaders. Furthermore, they loved and respected me both for the way I lived my own teachings and the way I had compassionately healed so many people and brought them comfort in their unhappy lives. They truly believed I was the Son of God. How could the Son of God end up on the cross, they asked each other. Their horror increased with every question. It was unthinkable. They felt a tremendous void opening up in front of them, a void in their lives, and a huge crater in the earth on which they walked, and a vast expanse of instability and lack of purpose within themselves. What I told them about my future crucifixion, they dared not contemplate. Such an event would destroy everything they had believed in with all their hearts. Consequently, my disciples loudly and volubly resisted what I tried to tell them and stated again and again that such a thing could never be. When I stood firm against their stubborn denials, they were eventually forced to quiet their arguments and outwardly accept that such a thing might be possible. I told them that after my death they would see me again and that I expected them to carry on the work I had started. The pain and argumentativeness I had aroused in my disciples also affected me deeply. It was no easy undertaking to go to Jerusalem where my fate awaited me. More than anything, I wondered how I would measure up to this great challenge of my endurance. Would I be able to transcend the physical condition and enter into universal father consciousness and remain there until I died? At times I was deeply frightened of the ordeal, but I dare not reveal this fear to my disciples. Therefore, I began my last journey toward Jerusalem with powerfully mixed feelings. On the one hand, I was weary of healing and talking and teaching people who listened with open mouths and had no real understanding of anything I was trying to tell them. I had thought that my knowledge would enable people to climb out of their misery and, at the very least, make contact with the Father and gain a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven. There had been no evidence of such a spiritual awakening, even amongst my disciples. My disappointment and sense of failure made me glad to be moving on from the earth life to the glorious existence I knew awaited me after my death. At the same time, I wondered how I would endure the pain of the crucifixion. Throughout my mission, I had lived in a more or less consistently peaceful, frequently exalted state of mind, with my thoughts focused on the Father Love Consciousness, author of all being, knowing that I had but to ask and what I asked for would swiftly manifest itself. Would I be able to keep my equanimity when brought before the council, when led out to my crucifixion, when nailed to the cross, with my weight hanging from my hands? Because I was now giving way to doubts and fears, the normal level of my consciousness frequencies were dropping. They were taking me down into frequencies of the earth plane consciousness. I became a prey again to my old aggression, prompting me to unreasonable actions I would never have contemplated earlier when in my former state of total harmony with the Father Love Consciousness. My doubts and conflicts externalized in my life as human emotions and impulses, which contravened the cosmic law of love. First there was the episode of the fig tree. I was hungry and went to the tree, not really expecting to find fruit, because it was not the right season for figs. When my search was unfruitful, I cursed the fig tree. Twenty-four hours later, it was shriveled to its roots. It was a shocking experience. It was the first time my words had caused harm to anything. However, it clearly demonstrated for my disciples the power of thought for good or evil. It showed them that the more spiritually evolved a person is, the greater is the impact of their words on the environment. I took the opportunity to point out to my disciples that I had thoughtlessly behaved as does the average man or woman who, when having high expectations, cannot get what they want. They usually react with anger, tears, hostility, and even sharp words which might or might not amount to a kind of ill-wishing or cursing of the person who had denied them their heart's desire. They had now seen for themselves 
what my cursing had done to the fig tree. They should now be able to understand that while a strong conviction would bring about anything they might desire and imagine, they must also be constantly aware of their own mental, emotional condition. They must not harbor resentment against others, but must swiftly forgive. Otherwise they could do much damage to those they resented, which damage would return to them in due course as a harvest of their sowing. Furthermore, as one sows, so does one reap. I knew that what I had done to the fig tree would inevitably return to me in one form or another. I took my disciples to the temple. It was many years since I had been there, and I knew my visit would serve to set in train the events which would lead to my crucifixion. Some of the people recognized me, and in response to their request I began to teach them. More people gathered and crowded the money lenders who began to complain. Their shouting and loud complaints broke my train of thought as I was teaching. Suddenly my wrath was aroused. Here were people earnestly gathered around me, wanting to hear the words of life which soon I would not be able to speak to them. And there were the money lenders who made their living by selling livestock for sacrifices, which did the people no good whatever. These men only brought people into debt and misery. I felt a rush of blood to my head, and I pushed the tables over, scattering their money, and I drove the money-hearted men out of the temple. Now there was a great commotion of shouting and screaming. Some people were scrambling to pick up the money. The money lenders were calling down curses on my head, denouncing me as evil, as one doing the work of Beelzebub, and a thousand other devils. The priests and Pharisees and all the people who set great store by the sacrifices in the temple came running together to find out the cause of the noise and confusion. On hearing the money lender's story, they were so outraged by my actions, they launched into vociferous condemnation of me and lamentations to impress the priest, each one making louder protest than their neighbors to demonstrate their horror at what I had done. Such a thing had never been seen in the temple before. Even those who had previously listened to me were now disturbed at my willfulness and wondered what kind of man I might be. They were standing close together, watching the proceedings, when they were noticed and approached by the priests and Pharisees who persuaded them I was trying to destroy all that they had believed in, preaching a false god entirely unlike anything they had ever heard about in their synagogues. The priests passed on their own outraged anger to the people and convinced them that my sin would contaminate them also if they persisted in listening to my madness. Gradually, the people were persuaded I was an evil influence and should be removed before I could disrupt the peace of the country and bring down the wrath of the Roman governor on the entire country of Palestine. My disciples, ashamed of what I had done, quietly left the scene and hid amongst the alleys some way from the temple. When they returned to me later, they clearly showed that they were also sorely tried by my actions. They wondered whether I had taken leave of my senses, gone mad, prophesying my death, and then doing those very things which would probably be the cause of it. It was at that time that Judas, who had never fully shed his Jewish beliefs, began to doubt whether I was the Messiah after all. Three years I had taught the people, and there was no lessening of the Roman rule. Three years, and people were no nearer the happiness I had promised them, and now it seemed that I was about to become a disturber of the peace, bringing down the wrath of Rome on their heads. He heard that the Jewish high priest wanted to get rid of me, and so he offered his services to identify my person when required to do so. When it was time for me to eat the Passover with my disciples, I arranged we should eat it all together in a large supper room. I knew it would be the last time I would eat any food on earth. I do not want to return deeply to the consciousness of that night. I felt great sadness to be leaving my disciples who had served me so well. With my sadness came a return of all my fears and conflicts. I had moments of deep emotional self-pity. I felt that no one understood all I had tried to do for my people 
and the sacrifice I was prepared to make for them. John was giving a vivid account of the story of the Israelites last night in Egypt before they escaped into the desert. He spoke of Moses' instruction to the head of each family to kill an unblemished lamb, to cook it in a certain way, and paint its blood on the doorpost of all Israelite dwellings, because that very night angels would come and slaughter all the firstborn children of the Egyptians and their livestock. With great relish he recalled the outcry made by the Egyptians when they woke to find the bloodied firstborn in every home. None was spared. It was the kind of horrible story I rejected as having any value for anyone seeking higher spiritual truth. I wondered how much my disciples had really understood when I spoke of their heavenly Father and His love for all mankind. How could they relish the thought of angels killing the Egyptian firstborn when I had clearly told them that God the Father was love? But the Jews had always been preoccupied with the shedding of blood to atone for their sins. Even Abraham, the founder of the Israelite nation, had been convinced he should take his only son into the desert and kill and offer him as a sacrifice to God, a pagan and revolting thought. I thought of the animal sacrifices in the temple. Loving all the wild things of creation as I did, the practice was an abomination to me, and now I was about to be put to death because I had dared to speak the words of truth. And when I considered how little I had achieved in passing on my knowledge, I wondered why I had been sent on such a mission. I felt a momentary spasm of resentment and anger interthreading my usual feelings of love for these men. With some cynicism, I wondered what effective token of remembrance I could leave with them to bring back to their minds all my teachings when I was no longer with them. If they could so swiftly forget all my teachings on the Father love and enjoy the horrible story of the Passover while I was still in the room with them, how much would they remember when I had died as a felon on the cross, the most despicable of deaths? Then it came to me that since they were so moved by the shedding of blood, I would give them blood to remember me by. With these ironical reflections, I took up a loaf of bread, broke it, and passed it to my disciples and told them to eat it. I likened the brokenness of the bread to the future brokenness of my body, and asked them to repeat this breaking of bread and distribution as a means of remembering the sacrifice of my body to bring them the truth, the truth about God, and the truth about life, the truth about love. Realizing I was in a strange mood, they stopped eating, listened, took the bread, and ate it silently. Next I took up my goblet of wine and passed it around, saying that they must each drink from it, for it was a symbol of my blood which would shortly be shed, because I had dared to bring them the truth of existence. I saw that the edge in my voice had reached some of them. Soberly, each one took a sip and then passed the goblet to his neighbor. But still they said nothing. They sensed I was in earnest, and would not tolerate any more argument. Then I told them that a certain man amongst them would betray me. Privately, I understood his motives and knew that he was a necessary part of the future sequence of events. He was but playing a role which his nature had prompted him to do. I knew he would suffer greatly, and I felt compassion for him. But these thoughts I kept to myself. When I mentioned that one of them would betray me and told Judas to leave and do what he had to do quickly, The disciples came alive, wondering if this was really their last meal with me. Now there was a great deal of emotional distress, questions, even recriminations, for having led them into such a trap. Again they wondered what they would do with their lives after I had gone. They asked what kind of standing they would have in the community if I were crucified. They would be an object of derision, they argued. No one would ever again believe a word they spoke. Deeply saddened by their self-centered response to my predicament, I assured them they had no need to fear for their own safety. They would abandon me and would not be connected to my crucifixion. After my death, I suggested they should disperse 
and returned to Galilee. This touched Peter deeply, and he reacted vehemently, denying he would ever abandon me. But of course he did. All the love that I had felt for my fellow men, all that I had longed to accomplish for them, in this moment of my own need, still met with blank non-comprehension, even resistance. Their only concern was what would happen to them. There was no word of kindness, offering of help, anguish for my future ordeal. How hard was the human heart, I thought. How many weary centuries would pass before mankind would be able to move beyond their own hurt and pain to feel even a glimmer of love and compassion for other unfortunates in a worse situation than themselves. And so, although deeply disappointed, even hurt, by their selfish reactions, I also understood them and attempted to give my disciples courage to face the future and assured them that I would always be with them, even when I was hidden from their sight. The work I had started would be promoted from the life beyond. I would not leave them alone. They would know and feel my presence, and this would be a comfort to them. I told them to cling to their memories of my time with them. I warned that there would be many who would continue in the knowledge I had given them, but there would be outsiders who would seek to add the voice of tradition and reason to my teachings. My words would be so distorted that eventually they would no longer reveal the original truth I had brought to the world. When I told them that this would happen, they were upset, even panic-stricken. I was relieved to see that my teachings had not been in vain, after all. They had not entered totally deaf ears. They asked me to tell them more, but I raised my hands and said that that was all I could say. At this point, I felt I had said all I ever wanted to say while on earth, that my speech with men had been accomplished. All I greatly, deeply desired was to retreat into silence and find peace and comfort in my contact with the Father. We left the supper room and walked to the Mount of Olives, but the mood of my disciples was one of inner conflict, fear, and doubt. Most of them left to join their families and friends who would be still celebrating their own Passover. In the garden, there was a special boulder, shaped like a little cave. I liked to shelter in it from the wind, and so I sat and meditated and prayed, seeking a way into the exalted harmony I had enjoyed in the past. I knew that when I moved into attunement with the Father love, my fears would dissolve and I would be in a state of total and absolute peaceful confidence again. As I felt the power of love move into me and possess my human consciousness, so did the strength to endure what lay ahead possess my heart. I would be able to remain within the love and give the love to others to the very end. And so it was. I will not even attempt to re-enter into the trial and crucifixion state. It is of no consequence. When I finally died on the cross and my spirit withdrew from my tortured body, I was lifted into ineffable and radiant light. I was enclosed in the warmth and comfort of love, such as I had never experienced before. I had a sensation of enveloping praise, a powerful assurance of work well done, of ecstasy and universal strength, to continue the work and the joy and rapture which is far beyond any that the earthly condition can ever know. I moved into a new and wondrously beautiful way of life, but I still descended in consciousness to remain in touch with the people I had left behind. I was able to show myself to those who were sufficiently sensitive to be able to see me. However, the story of Thomas who supposedly fingered my wounds is nonsense. My disciples did not know that I had secretly arranged with Joseph of Arimathea to take my body to his own unused tomb after my death, where he would anoint it according to custom before the sunset. Then when darkness had fallen and the Sabbath was being observed by everyone in Jerusalem, assisted by two mounted trustworthy servants, he would take my body secretly by during the night and by out-of-sight tracks during the day to a mountainside outside of Nazareth in Galilee. There, further assisted by my family, if he followed my directions, 
he would find a small hidden cave which had given me shelter from the storms and a refuge from people when I was young, unhappy, and rebellious, and at odds with the world. Joseph promised to find the cave from a map I had given him and to lead me there after further embalming. He would build up the small entrance to thoroughly block it from intruders. There my body has rested, free from molestation. It has been said of me that my body rose from the dead. What an absurdity conjured up by earthly minds which were at a loss to satisfactorily explain my death as a felon on a cross. What need would I have of an earthly body to continue existence in the next dimension? How could such a ridiculous myth persist even into the 21st century? It has been a measure of the lack of understanding of Christians that they have blindly accepted such a dogma to this very time. Think about this carefully. Having been released from an earthly body, and after my experience of the ecstasy and glorious rapture of passing into a higher dimension of universal consciousness, why would I want to return to the earthly dimension to enter my body again? Of what use would it be to me in your world or in mine? While the physical substance of my body might be spiritualized when perfectly attuned to the Father Love Consciousness, while I still lived on earth, would not my body be an encumbrance and a deterrent to my subsequent journeys within the highest spiritual kingdoms? Visible things are but a manifestation of specific frequencies of vibration and consciousness, which produces a shimmer of motes or particles, giving an appearance of solid matter. Each visible substance possesses its own unique vibrational frequency. A change in the rate of vibration produces a change in the appearance of matter. As consciousness energies change, so do the appearances of matter change. Therefore, it was possible for me to focus and lower my frequencies of consciousness to that point where my form became visible to the human eye. I could return to my disciples and be seen by them, and I did so. I loved them more than ever before and owed them as much comfort and support as I was able to give them after my death. Not only this, it was necessary to direct my own power into their minds in order to give them the impetus and courage to continue the work I had started. However, I want you to know that the individualized consciousness which has ascended in vibrational frequencies to the very portals of the universal creative dimension becomes light individualized. An individualized consciousness which needs no body in which to express and enjoy all that the glorious consciousness can devise in the highest spiritual realms. It is a supreme and enraptured state of being, having none of the needs, desires, impulses experienced by those who have not fully mounted high beyond and above the ego. While living on earth, your minds remain anchored within certain parameters of vibrational frequencies, imprisoned in bodies which have their own needs. If your consciousness were to truly soar beyond these parameters, your earthly self would disappear. When I was trapped in a body, I was also largely confined to these parameters of vibrational frequencies and consciousness. Furthermore, imagination alone can soar no further than your previous experiences, and therefore you are confined to your past, which you project into your future. However, little by little, you will be led by those minds which are sensitive enough to access the higher spiritual dimensions and can thus move beyond your present consciousness boundaries. They will record for you those wondrous experiences and states of being beyond your own, to which you yourselves will then be able to aspire. In this way, you go forwards in levels or steps of spiritual development. Each step brings you a higher vision of what can be achieved, and out of this vision you formulate a new goal. With this goal ever before you, you work to cleanse yourself of the contaminating influence of the bonding rejection impulses of your earthly existence. Step by step, you transcend your ego. 
When you transcend your ego and it dies within your consciousness, you are now abundantly alive within the Father Love Consciousness and find the reality of the Kingdom of Heaven in your lives, within yourself, and in your environment. To enable you to reach these pinnacles of love, joy, harmony, and rapture, I lived, worked, and died in Palestine, and I have come to you now in these letters. Let not my work be in vain this second time. As you read these pages, seek, meditate, and pray for inspiration. You will come to feel the Father's response, and if you listen every day attentively, you will hear the Father's voice. This voice is ever with you. Dismantle the barriers created by self-will. Open yourselves to receive strength, power, inspiration, and love direct from the Father Love Consciousness. Read and reread these letters that they may eventually become absorbed into your consciousness. As you do so, you will be journeying towards light, and you will radiate light to others. Such light is not just light as in electricity, but is the very nature of universal consciousness, which I describe to you in my letter one. Therefore, as you radiate the light, you will radiate unconditional love. You will promote the growth and spiritual development of every other living entity. You will yearn to nourish and nurture. You will work to promote protection and healing and education. You will long to assist in the establishment of loving law and order in which all will be able to live harmoniously, successfully, and prosperously. You will be in the kingdom of heaven. At the same time, let there be no illusions. As the steps are taken to introduce these letters to the outside world, there will be exactly the same recriminations, the same condemnation, the same talk of Satan, the devil, as there was when I first taught in Palestine. Take heart. Pray for courage. Those who endure to the end will rise above the turmoil and violence and will rest in the peace and joy of the kingdom.